Okay, so let's just start off by asking. You see, well, uh, the band has been Singapore, been to Singapore on numerous occasions, right? So, why are you most keen on this thing? Why am I most keen on yeah. coming to Singapore? Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's always nice to come to an English-speaking country because <laughs> we can have a conversation from stage. But I mean, it's a beautiful place, um, and uh, you know, the, the people and the fans are great. The first time we came here, I want to say we played at like a symphony hall or some kind of opera house, and. You know, you never know what to expect when you go somewhere for the first time, and sometimes it's the first impression, much like meeting people, that, that determines whether you go back to that place or that person. And it, we just had a really, really amazing experience, and, and also realized how many people came from around Malaysia and the Philippines yeah. just to the Singapore show, because it was the only one in the region at the time we were doing it. And, you know, that first show uh, just sort of put a, put a big check mark in the box of like, be sure to return for us. Um, and uh, the food is great. Um, it's, it's not too far away from Australia, which we almost always get to, you know, on every album cycle at least a couple of times. So yeah. uh, it's just no question. I mean, if we had a terrible experience here, um, we wouldn't come back. So <laughs> <laughs> well, things are going well. Enough. Okay, well, speaking of Philippines, you guys played in Manila last night, right? Mm -hmm. So how was the experience there? That's crazy. Um, the Philippine people are probably the the most avid sort of music fans that I've mm -hmm. I've ever seen in my tours and travels. But it is very crazy to see and humbling to see uh, no middle class, you know, and the division of wealth and poverty over there, and how pop densely populated that city is. So it's a little saddening for me to go to Manila and not be able to just walk down the street, or go to a night market, or you know, find things to do when we're there. Uh, but that being said, I'm, I'm really fortunate that I get to see parts of the world that are very different from where I come from and where I live with my family. Uh, the show was great, the festival was, is, was pretty well run. We did have a few technical issues, uh, but you know, you put on a game face, put a smile on, and do your best. Bon Iver, who are good friends of ours, uh, played just before us, and they gave them the famous very great band. They also played. So the best thing about that kind of thing, festivals, uh, is just that you get to be with friends that you wouldn't normally see. Mm -hmm. Also, oddly, it was like on the exact day, four years after we had been there the first time, March 5th. So that was a little weird. So maybe <laughs> March 5th is Manila Day for us. Yeah, could mark that on the calendar. Yeah. yeah. All right, so let's talk some more about like the music. All right, uh, so what's the influences? What are the influences you had writing like the latest record? We, you know, we all have really broad, diverse uh, record collections, and you know, Ben is the primary songwriter, and so it's hard to say exactly. You know, when he comes up with a demo or a sketch of Blueprint. Can't always say where that came from. You know, I know that he. Um, he has a lot of influences, uh, uh, and you know that could be anywhere from classic songwriters like Brian Wilson, um, and obviously Leonard McCartney to you know some of the bands he grew up with like Red House Painters and R.E.M. and um, or what some of the other influences he talks about. It's hard to say. I you know I could point from my perspective, which sure. is I I really enjoy a lot of electronic music, even though I play an acoustic instrument. Um, I really enjoy, uh, like uh, James Blake. Yeah. He's a big, uh, he's a big hero of mine. Um, I like what FKA Twigs has been doing. Oh, that is it. Um, but you know, I mean, people are creating music you know, with computers these days that just you know, without physical limitations. It's mm -hmm. fun to hear what people's you know, creative dreams and ideas are when they once they come to shape in terms of songwriting, composing. Um, so uh, John Hopkins is another big mm -hmm. fan. Uh, big hero of mine um, but really you know when you're a musician much like being an author if you don't read books you're not a very good writer and you, you you know with music you have to you have to check everything out so 
yeah. if I don't constantly check in and see what albums came out today or yesterday, or, you know, like I would miss the fact that Kendrick Lamar had a new album titled <laughs> Untitled Unmastered. Yeah, you know, like you I mean. need to know these things. You can't just be stuck chasing down career bands of the 60s and 70s just because they have a great catalog. Uh, but I, you know, I buy as many jazz records as I buy psychedelic rock records, as I buy prog rock records, even metal albums, pop records. Um, you know, in the same week I will buy um, Megadeth, Adele, John Coltrane, and Kendrick Lamar. And it's, like I said, it's just part of the vocabulary. It's what I need to do. So whenever someone asks what have you been listening to or what inspires you, it's all over the map. I got most inspired last night by listening to the soundtrack for The Revenant. Oh, in the movie nice, theater, yeah. <laughs> um, which is um, Ryuki, I'm spacing on his name, whoever the guy is. Yeah. Um, incredible, amazing movie, and without that soundtrack, without that, mm -hmm. you know, that ambient, ominous background, like, it would not be viable. Okay, so having said that, what are some of the challenges you personally, for yourself, while writing the record, where did you come across any challenges? This time around, I mean, there's, I think, we all have our own personal goals, you know, in terms of how we want to play, how we want to sound, and come across on the album. The biggest challenge with Kintsugi um, was, for me, just working with a new producer. Yeah. Uh, having Chris Walla step down from producing and wanting to work with an outside producer and all of us agreeing, like that was a new set of challenges in itself because the producer, Rich Costi, wasn't someone I needed to go on the road with. I didn't need to get in a bus or sit next to him on a plane or, you know, stand next to him in a hotel lobby at 5 a.m. when you're you're not in a good mood. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he had no problems telling me that I needed to do it again and again and again and again. So there were there were days when uh, I thought that I was done with the song. Like I played well, everyone agreed on the version, the sounds, and the performance, and then I, that would be a Friday, and I'd come in on a Monday, and you know, Rich would say, "I don't think we got it. We got to do it again." And it wasn't just for me; it was for maybe everybody. But he he worked really hard to make, you know, like he said one time, "Why can't every song be a single?" We want every song to be great. We don't just want to have album tracks and then for filler. So he was he was not easily impressed with, you know, kind of the first go of anything. I mean sometimes he was, there'd be something, some spark or moment of lightning, you know, where he'd be like, That's it, we're done, we got it. <laughs> but really he made us work incredibly hard and long um, and uh, really dig deep. And that, you know, when you're at it for you know, eight months or something like that. Uh, it starts to starts to make you kind of. I mean, the suffering is good. It's for a reason. <laughs> but it, it, it you know it makes you sometimes think, God, am I good? Am I doing the right thing? Like, is this going to work out? Of course it does. I totally did. Obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be back here. Yeah. And still, like being able to go to new places and being nominated for Grammys and um, having a really good show and response to an album, you know, eight records into our yeah. to our career. All right. So, well, speaking of Chris, so how do you think like his departure has sort of like shaped the outlook of the band in that sense? Um, you know, uh, I think everyone in this band has always been extremely dedicated and would be making music um, for a living. Regard, I mean, like our chemistry is so much stronger um, as a as a group than, than as individuals. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll never forget. And I've said this only a few times in interviews, but the first time I played with the band in 2002, before making Transatlanticism, yeah. I'll never forget the feeling. I could put myself there, close my eyes, sitting behind the drums, and I, I had rehearsed the songs, I felt really prepared. But I remember feeling like looking around the room and thinking, watching Ben and Nick and Chris, like, boy, these guys are just gonna keep going whether I make this audition or not. Like, there's. There's something about this band and each of these people's individuals that has this forward path, like this this goal, this intensity of like we're going to make music for a living. And um, so I remember feeling like I'm going to get left behind if I don't keep up, if I don't show up with with all the right stuff ready to go. And I I think that you know Chris conveyed to us when he made it known, a he wanted to do everything you know he could to make the 
this, this last record for him, yeah. you know, the best album we, we could make. But he also encouraged us to like continue on, like don't, you know, certainly don't wait for me. Like I know you guys will continue to be a band, and you will find some people to play the parts or a person or whatever. Uh, but I remember that same sense, that connected thread to the past of like feeling like this bus is moving on, whether you know with or without you. Um, and I think that uh, it it allowed us to quickly find a couple people that we knew would be appropriate. Yeah. Both as like human beings, like in terms of internal chemistry, yeah. and great players that they could learn the parts and show off. And that's Dave Depper, um, and who's playing guitar and some keys, and Zach Ray, who's playing mostly keys right. and guitar. But both of those guys, I mean, the biggest question, you know, is that we didn't have that history like we did with Walla. And like, how is it going to work when you're in those tight quarters? Like I said before, you know, 5 a.m. lobby yeah. calls and like late nights and no <laughs> sleep and. You know, that's when the real challenge comes out. It's not so much about stepping on a stage and being able to play up the songs from start to finish. It's, it's all the internal stuff, because you're on top of each other. Um, but, you know, both of those guys, we have somewhat of a history with, and uh, we knew that it, that it was likely that we would all get along, and so far it's been wonderful. They've been great players. They've brought a, a fresh energy to the stage. Um, and. You know, I don't remember at any point having any fears about whether or not we would be able to carry on and present a really rad Death Cab show. And so having an extra set of hands too, having five guys on stage instead of four, means that we've been able to um, not have to make any concessions about how songs are presented live. But as a four piece, which is Ben and Nick and Chris and I, mm -hmm. The, the albums were often so lush that we had to decide what got left out. Um, like, well, we can't play the piano part because we need two guitars. That's right. The other way around, the piano part's more important than the acoustic and the electric. But now we don't have to make those decisions. So I think that, that Zach and Dave both um, brought a ton of energy and life into the live show that has not been there in the past. And I look forward to being able to you know, work on a new record with them. It's five people in the studio. That's right. Well, the first record that you actually worked with with Def Cat was Transatlanticism, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a hit with many fans worldwide. So, how different has it? Does it feel now to play that song compared when um, you played it back then? Um, you mean with the new group, or just as time goes on? It, yeah. Look, that album has such a special place for me because that was, uh, you know, I feel like Ben and Nick and Chris have kind of been searching for the right person to you know, to add to the band. You know, they've been through three drummers before Transatlanticism. Um, they had asked me to be a part of the band to fill in some of those holes where they were without. Yeah. And I just wasn't the right time or I was playing with other people. And when I finally did commit, when I got in that room, when we started making Transatlanticism, I remember feeling that like this was this this could be the last job I ever have. In, at least in the next decade or two. Um, like, if I just don't screw up and just work hard. And uh, so those songs, whenever we play anything from Transatlanticism, I, again, close my eyes and it takes me back to that period of like, feeling like I really had something to, like I needed to prove something. Like I was standing at the end of the line and like I wanted to, I was gonna wait no matter how long it took to get to the other side. And um, that, I mean, they, they will always have a special place in our heart. And not everything is played from Transatlanticism, but just about everything has been. And we still, to this day, you know, New Year has such an anthemic feel because it was a proclamation of this new group, you know, like my joining the band. And, and um, it's, yeah, it hasn't changed, other than the fact that it's much bigger now because <laughs> there's Zach, Dave, Ben, all of them are playing electric guitar. Yeah. <laughs> so it sounds huge. <laughs> the sidetrack a little, like you say, you think you undertook, I understand you undertook many jobs prior to joining the band. And, you know, uh, you enjoy building things and you actually have flair for mechanical reasoning. So do you still have a strong interest in that field? Wow, well, you did some research. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of going around and, and seeing what kind of architecture is, you know, in the world. I take a lot of pictures of things. It gives me ideas for going home and building, whether it's Legos or like forts in the woods with my kids. I, you know, I'm always interested in in building things. I uh, 
built a lot of the recording studio that I that we made part of uh, transit lines or uh, narrow stairs in. Uh, but I mean that's that's one of my passions. I have several outside of music, but um, building is is one thing. But I, I'm a big um, fly fisherman, <laughs> and uh, I so I'll, I'll research regions and find guides or go off the beaten path and you know um, do a lot of that stuff, even if it's coastal regions. Uh, and I'm a pretty avid reader. But I mean, we, we draw inspiration from all different areas, not just music. But if I didn't physically stand on top of playing, I would be like, you know, a runner that shows up for a marathon having never run in between the races. So I, I still have a lot of work to do in terms of practicing and building my skill set there. Right. So, I mean, of course, you're also a private instructor at Seattle Drum School, right? So tell me how does it. What does it mean to you to be like a teacher and a mentor to these kids? Very important. If, I think if you have a gift, give back. Like I became a teacher so that I could become a better student. Mm -hmm. um, you know, anyone who spends any time in a classroom with kids, say primary grades, like really young kids, yeah, uh, I think you really benefit from seeing that everyone has different abilities of learning. But you also see the, the wonder and the beauty of like naivety and you know the simplest things, you know, like a broken crayon, what that creates for a kid. And when I started teaching music years and years and years ago, uh, seeing little kids get the idea, you know, of how to put together hands of beat to play a beat to sustain it, to play along with their favorite songs, you know, they would come into the school that I taught at and we, I would say like bring whatever your favorite song is, whatever your favorite album is, put it on. And um, I, I will never forget the days, I mean I was get, almost get goosebumps when I, when I would see, thinking about it, that is when I would see like a seven year old kid play along to whatever their favorite song was, if it was a Led Zeppelin record that their dad passed them or Imagine Dragons or Taylor Swift, like doesn't matter whether it was anything that I would I would be a part of like being able to teach them to have to be able to walk that line and fall along with the music they just grin ear to ear and you know it reminds me that like what I get to do what we get to do is really one of the greatest jobs in the world I mean to be able to share music with people I mean I hit things with sticks I've hit <laughs> things with sticks for 30 years and somehow I've been able to support a whole family doing it um, and that's never anything you take for granted and you know I was also a kid with tons of burning questions like I always wanted to get to meet my heroes and ask them how they did what they do and any of them that took the time to talk with me or to you know give me a lesson on the side or whatever I will never forget those people I'm still in touch with those people those musicians and it's not just drummers it's songwriters as well but I, you know, it'd be foolish and selfish for me to not give some of that back um, to people that are going to hopefully inspire future generations of musicians. All right. So, I guess what's what's next for the band? Is there a new record in the works, which is more? Yeah, three? we're. Yeah, I mean, there's um, Ben's been writing a lot, and we all also write, and kind of contribute, and share ideas with each other, and uh, we. Um, you know, I'm not going to say exactly when we're going to start on another record, but we have to finish this album cycle first, mm -hmm. which will take us through the fall. Uh, but definitely by next year, uh, we're going to test the waters with, I'm sure, all five of us. And, you know, keep it going. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Like, just keep moving. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be back here within a few years with some, we've got more new songs. Mm -hmm.